ready to get started. Um, my name is Kate Hamry, for those of you who I don't know. Um, I'm the Director of Sustainability here in Concord and really excited to welcome you to our first Sustainable Landscaping Workshop. Um, I'm going to let Melissa tell you kind of the origin story of this, but I just wanted to say I'm really excited to be doing this project. There are so many sustainability aspects of landscaping, um, and this is going to be hopefully a really helpful, practical, hands-on workshop. Um, we're doing two more, which I think if we go to the next slide. And just, oh, thanks. Um, so this is the first in a series, so we hope you can join us for the other workshops. Um, we're talking about different topics um, at the next one, so they definitely flow together or they stand alone. So if you have friends and neighbors who couldn't come tonight and wanna come to future workshops, definitely encourage them to do that as well. Um, and this will be recorded so folks can watch it later. Um, and uh, the, the other product that will come out of this project is a handbook. So that will have a resource going forward mm -hmm for folks in Concord, how do you do sustainable landscaping? Um, and this ties in with our demonstration gardens, which I know a lot of you got to check out one of them here. So i um, really excited to have you all here and um, have a great team that will be leading you through this workshop tonight. So I will stop there and let Melissa take it from here. Thanks, Kate. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Melissa Simoncini. I work in, in the Water and Sewer Division. So how this project all started was because during the summertime, we put an awful lot of our drinking water on our landscape outside. And that makes our lives very challenging. And it's mainly because when we're putting water on our landscape, we are pumping all of our water supplies at 100%. And then we may not have enough water for drinking or even firefighting purposes. Um, and then it becomes even more challenged when let's say we have a thunderstorm, which also includes some lightning, and then one of our supplies goes down. And then we just have less and less water available. So that's just one of the um, reasons this whole project got started is my job dealing with water conservation. And one of the things uh, as part of that was every, a lot of people like the general aesthetic of a lawn. And I know I'm speaking to the choir here. Most of you guys know the big, vast green lawns are unsustainable. So for a while, I've been trying to figure out a way to help people figure out how they can have the green aesthetic of a lawn without having as much of an impact as your standard green lawn. So that's how the um, demonstration garden theory gets started. When Kate came on board, I shared this idea with her and she also was excited about it and we were able to combine it with this speaker series. Um, so it was really funny, just a couple of weeks ago, um, Popular Mechanics, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the magazine, it's a pretty standard old school engineering magazine. Um, I used to read it, my dad used to get it, he was an engineer. It was all about robotics, all about hard engineering. It's all about state-of-the-art stuff that's coming out. This past month, there was a whole um, article that pretty much talked all about sustainable landscaping. And you know, I wrote down kind of, I think it was the opening paragraph of this. Um, it said, most American yards don't reflect their ecological condition. The plants need to be treated with fertilizer because the soil is not right. They want water, the weather doesn't provide. Wildlife disappears because there's no longer, or they no longer have food to eat. All this creates a larger ecological footprint because they're working against nature instead of with it. It was something that really just kind of works with this whole speaker series. And so, you know, having a landscape, a sustainable landscape means different things to many different people. One of the better things is you can reduce ongoing maintenance. All these things just help reduce your overall carbon and ecological footprint. You support local insect populations, require less fertilizer, less water, and capture more carbon, and even encourage groundwater recharge, which helps us sustain the public water supplies. So the goal of the workshop series is to help you create some reasonable and actionable items. We don't want you to come away from the speaker series going, oh great, now what? This, we want you to actually come out with some 
actionable steps that you can take home, some ways to find a contractor to help you, some steps you can take for your own maintenance, or steps that you can give to your landscaper to help make your property a little bit more sustainable. Uh, yeah, and so really whatever it means to you, we want you to work throughout this workshop series to be able to come out with a checklist and be able to go home and actually make a difference instead of going, okay, what do I do now? So Elise and Leslie um, are here from Bowler Engineering. Um, they are gonna work you through a little, walk you through a little bit about how you can design a more sustainable landscape for your home. When, whether that means that it's you guys designing for yourself or you working with a designer to help you design it, they're here to kind of walk you through what all that means to make. Okay. Thanks. Nope. I didn't have any slides, that's fine. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, so all of this, <laughs> it's why we have these slides. Um, all of this is funded um, via a grant through actually MAPC. So it's not actually the state, it's the local or the regional planning authority. Um, they, um, there's a group called MAGIC um, that stands for, what does MAGIC stand for again? Metropolitan area, area versus, I don't know. Yes, well anyways, <laughs> <Indian> area, <laughs> yeah. it's this whole region here. Um, so one of the reasons that they like this grant is because it's not just Concord Center. It's not only applicable to Concord. People haven't done the um, demonstration gardens. Nobody's had a handbook that people can really take and have actionable items. So anything that we're learning here can be replicated in any other town. That was one of the benefits of our proposal. Um, and more sustainability, got it. And oh yes, also building a community. One of the things that we wanted to do is have these sessions where people can talk to one another and work with their neighbors. We had, um, just a few weeks ago, we had um, what we called stakeholder engagement sessions, I guess, where we took um, local um, environmental groups or people that are in community groups to hear what um, sustainable landscaping meant to them, hear some of the challenges. And we also worked with landscapers. So landscapers are people actually doing it. We don't wanna come up with you know some things that we think are amazing, but are not practical. So all those items, all those comments that we got as part of those listening sessions, we're bringing in as part of these presentations in the workshop series, and they're gonna help build that handbook at the end. All right. And these are just some beautiful examples of what sustainable landscapes can actually look like. Okay. Um, so thank you, I'm Leslie Fanger. I'm a landscape architect from Boulder Engineering. Um, I know engineering is part of our title, but we have a fairly sizable landscape architecture group and planning group at Bowler. Um, so I'm here with Elise Jim. She's a landscape designer that's helping uh, with this uh, project. So um, as Melissa said, we want you to walk away with a knowledge and a, sort of a, a guideline on how to approach either designing your own landscape or working with contractors and um, letting them know what it is that's important to you in terms of changing up your property or if you're building new, you know, uh, you want to incorporate sustainable practices. So we're going to go through together. It's not going to be just me up here droning on. Uh, we're going to, it's going to be a very interactive and collaborative and um, hopefully fun time here tonight. Cause that's the thing we're designers right <laughs> and in our office we work with a bunch of engineers and they're just like stuck in their cubes like yeah. doing their work you come to our space and it's like the collaborative corridor right, right. oh we keep it all open and we're collaborating on almost every single project right yeah so that's what we're doing here we have like a little mini studio going on here exactly so um the design steps um first of all who's going to do the work it's it, it's very individual we're going to sort of uh, step you through what the options are in that. Um, and then say, we're going to treat this as um, assuming that you're all going to do your own work for this, just this little exercise. Um, so what do you start with? You have to have a, a plan of your property to know where your property lines are, what the topography is, what the solar orientation is, where your buildings are, and so forth. Um, and then what does your property look like? You know, does it, does it have wetlands? Does it have 
uh, stage scopes, where's the shade. So we'll teach you how to um, map that out on your plan that, that we're going to put together. Um, then you want to figure out what are your needs in your landscape. You know, you, do you have kids? Do you have pets? Um, do you want uh, to reduce your water use? You know, what are your sustainable goals for your property? Um, then we're going to do a couple different alternatives, and that will take you through like you, you just sort of think about everything you want. It's it's like the dream session. You know, you just draw little circles and figure it all out. And then at the end, you're going to take those alternatives and the ideas that you had and put them into one final design. So that's sort of the process we're going to go through. You're each going to get some plans. You're going to be able to scribble with pencils and so forth. Um, and so when we go through the process, I just want to make sure that whoever doesn't feel comfortable doing the drawing, you know, work with your neighbor, work with the people at your table. It doesn't have to be just every everyone doing their own thing. It'll be fun to, to actually, you know, get to know the people next to you and, and work together on, on your ideas. Okay. So first of all, who's going to do the work? So who wants to do their own work? Who wants to do their own design? Awesome. See that? We've got some creative, daring people, uh, and that's why you're here. So you're going to design it, and you're going to install it yourself? Yeah? Cool. That's great. Yeah. So you know, you don't have to do it all at once. You can do it in phases, and that's the benefit of sort of being a, almost a, a master planning process and, and creating a design for yourself. Then you, you can understand how those projects might interact with each other and um, what makes the most sense to do first, second, third. Um, all right, then there's another option. You design it, and maybe you have a contractor that works with you to install either all of it or some of it, do it in phases, you know? It doesn't have to be just you doing everything. Or you can get someone like um, Elise and I to help with um, the design, and you install with the assistance of a contractor. So an example would be, um, we work together, me the de professional designer, you the client, we come up with a really good design, and you say, okay, <clears throat> I think I can handle digging the holes and planting the plants. You know, because that's manageable, it's not a lot of heavy, heavy lifting. But the hard part is the preparation. So maybe you hire a contractor to come in, you know, dig out your plant beds or dig out where you're going to put your pavers, you know, so there are all sorts of these different options in, in working together. Um, and these are all sort of also, you know, costs, like this is the least expensive to the most expensive, okay? Um, and then the other option is to hire a professional designer and then the contractor installs it. There are so many different contractors that um, either just do the installation or they have a designer on staff that can work with you. Both Elise and I have that experience. We've worked for what's called a design build company, that they um, have good strong design skills, they can help you get the plants, and they can help you install it as well. Okay. So what are some of the resources? That's another thing that we're really driving home is that we want you to come away from this talk and know that the handbook later on that's going to result from this whole speaker series and this whole project, you're coming away with resources that um, say you do want to hire a, uh, a design build company, but you don't want to hire just Joe Schmo guy with a lawnmower. You want to hire someone that really has an understanding of sustainable uh, or a, a sustainable focus to their practice. So one really good resource is the Ecological Landscape Alliance. And at the end of this presentation, there are going to be websites that you can go to for, for all of these things. Um, if, so for instance, you're looking for a sustainable type of landscape contractor. This map is from the Ecological Landscape Alliance's website, and it shows where their members are located within um, striking distance of Concord. So not all of the blue dots are contractors, but you can go to their membership and see who is. Okay, so there's a really good resource if you're looking to hire someone. Um, another 
good resources, who's just looking at pictures, um, ASLA, which is the American Society of Landscape Architects, you can look on their membership uh, website and um, know, you know, sort of do a little bit more digging, like find out who's a member, find out what their practice is all about, whether they're sustainable practice or just you know, standard landscape architect. But we're all just wonderful, so. <laughs> um, and then the Boston Society of Landscape Architects is also probably more locally focused. Um, so the first thing you do, and again, we're giving you some, some resources here. Um, what do you need in your plan? Like, who would ever like not know where their property line is? There's always a, a problem. You go to plant a tree and you find out, oh gosh, it's my neighbor's tree now because I planted it on their property. Um, or conversely, they go and this is happening. <laughs> Uh, they go to clear trees, and we have to point out, you're clearing trees on my property. I, I don't want you to do that. So, you know, it's always really good to know where your property line is. And a resource for that um, is either your own Concord geographic information system, which if you go to Concord Town website, you can find where that is. And you'll, uh, you can go to your assessor's um, mapping information. That they're, they're called parcels. No parcel um, that would be the layer that you want to have turned on and it's just checking and unchecking and if you've never done it before it's really fun it's really fun to dive in you can get an aerial image of your property and um, so it's it, it's really a, a fun exercise and you can develop a scaled map from information in these two websites the state uh, mapping resource oftentimes the towns will will rely on information um, that's uh, statewide, such as wetlands um, and you know structures where they're located. Um, I don't think you'll be able to get utilities. I think you'll really need to kind of go back. So um, I think most of Concord is on uh, your own septic system, right? Is there a municipal system? I mean, there is. There is, it just, it's just right. Um, in the along Main Street. Okay. Much, but. All right. So, how many of you have your own septic system? Yeah. So, one way to locate that is to go to the Board of Health, and <laughs> they they will have information on that. Unless your property is like 100 years old and you have a, a, a yeah, whatever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so anyway. Um, it's very important to start with a scaled map so that you can really understand how far things are from your house or where your walkway is located or where your existing patio is. So as I mentioned, um, we're going to do an exercise together and I'm gonna let um, Elise take it from here through the, the design process. All right. So I'm gonna set property here, as you can see. It's actually my house. Um, I live in Worcester, so I'm very close to my neighbors. Um, and we bought this house about a year and a half ago. And we've been renovating the inside of it and haven't really touched the outside at all. So it's basically like a blank slate. Um, and the size of the property is also pretty small. <laughs> um, but what you're going to see is there's a lot of different constraints, but there's actually a lot of opportunities. So that's the interesting part about um, this parcel is, you know, even though it's so tiny, there are just so many different opportunities. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to pass out large 24 by 36 sheets of this property and also 11 by 17 sheets. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to uh, wait on using the larger sheets and just work with the smaller sheets first. Yeah. I'm just going to turn this over so we can point and wave. And uh, we're going to be doing bubble diagrams. And we'll tell you about what that's all about. But uh, we brought in color pencils. So uh, yeah, if, if everyone could have like two or three colors, that would be good. All right. Maybe. All right. And please feel free to speak up and 
ask questions. So, I guess, um, what would you prefer to do? Would you guys like to work together, or, yeah? Yeah, okay. So maybe, maybe just, yeah. <laughs> 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 All to me. <laughs> yep. He's totally okay with that. That's <laughs> problem. He can mow the lawn and I'll like take care of everything else. <laughs> Excuse me, the next show one of these? Are you going to have this? I think you're good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, just explain. All right. Sorry. So, as you can see, you all have a large sheet in front of you, which we're going to save. Um, and then you have the 11 by 17, and you have one page on the front and one page after that, which is the same thing. And what we're going to do is further on um, in the presentation, we're going to um, create a uh, bubble diagram on your first sheet, on your first one by 17, and then a second one on the next one. And then we're going to create our final design on the larger sheet. Yep. So going back to what Leslie was saying, it's super important to get your base plan set up, which we have set up for you guys today. Um, but it's also very important to note things like um, the wetlands and buffers on your site because that comes with a whole host of different constraints, if that's something that pertains to you. Um, also, invasive plants or pests, um, any kind of drainage constraints that you might have on your site, or even drainage that's coming in from a neighboring site, which happens more often, a drainage hole. Oh, wow. Between the properties? Is it like a sinkhole? Oh. Like a big hole in the drain? Oh, I see. Oh, so oh. it's like a tech basin or I don't know. Huh. Hmm. I'd be curious to find out where it is. <laughs> I don't yeah. know where it is. <laughs> 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 so we don't have a lot of water draining into it. I'm not sure why it was built. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also, uh, existing habitats that might be on your site. I know we've run into things where you could have an amphibian or moth habitat that's on your site. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, there's um, the Endangered Species Act. I don't know that you really um, have to be too worried about that, but it's, it's actually a piece of information that you can find on the G Mass GIS. There's a layer that's part of the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species program here in the state. So it's kind of interesting. Um, if you have a big yellow cross hatched thing going across your property, um, you can request information from the state to see what the endangered species is. Yeah. Okay. So, is this about moths? Yeah. 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 I, it just came to mind because we were just working on a, a project in Worcester where there was a protected moth habitat. Yeah. Believe it or not. You never know. You never know. So that's yeah. like step one. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Certain parts. Chances are you 
still do something with the property, but you want to know what it is. Yeah, and you want to um, create, uh, you want to preserve the habitat that the endangered species um, needs, right? And right. sort of work around that. Yeah, because another example is um, when I was in school, we were working on a studio project, and we're working on like a real life property, and there was a salamander like habitat mm -hmm. on the property, and they had to make sure that they couldn't put up any obstacles so that the salamanders like couldn't migrate to their like wetland home, mm -hmm. which, is, yeah. which is can be really tough mm -hmm. it's when a, you start to think about it. You'll have to create a. We're, Kind of taking the sidestep here but yeah but to your point it is important mm -hmm. um so if you do find that you have endangered species there's a whole process that you go through um that if you wanted to alter your land at all you just call up the natural heritage they're great they don't they're they're very um they work with you on how to protect the species and um you know it Unless you want to like subdivide your land and, and put a house up and all that, that that's a bit more. But um, they'll advise you as to what the species is. It won't be listed on the website because they don't want people going saying it's maybe it's a wood turtle. Well, they don't want people to say, oh, I love wood wood turtles and go and grab them. So it's it's more of a protective measure not to announce what the species of concern is on your property. Um, but yeah, they'll advise you on on how best to protect it whatever the species is. Yep. And just one more in addition, sure. in addition to the Endangered Species Act, there's the biomap. Okay, that yep. People want to consult to gain an understanding of what your ecosystem type might be. You may or may not be on the biomap, um, but much of the state is. So look at it and it will tell you, you know, what kind of ecosystems you have in your area that you can link up to that are on your property. Mm -hmm. um, so it's another tool. Really good. That's also the state natural heritage. Nice. Yeah. Um, so moving forward, um, once you have your base plan, um, then it's a matter of starting to think about how you want to design your spaces. So you know, do you have kids, pets? Do you want a patio, an outdoor kitchen, fire pit? Um, do you have steep slopes and erosion problems that you have to take into consideration? Um, are there any unstable structures on the site, you know, like sheds that should maybe come down because they're unsafe? Um, do you have paved areas that you potentially want to convert over to the um, pervious spaces, you know, whether it's taking out a, a like a whole patio and converting it to a pervious patio or taking it out completely and filling it in with vegetation? Just to explain a little bit of the terminology, um, so impervious surfaces are things like concrete and pavement and, and very, um, very tightly um, put together pavers and that sort of thing. A pervious surface will allow water to infil infiltrate down into the, into the ground and recharge our aquifers, which is, I think, um, Melissa is one of her, her biggest goals. She wants to make sure that the water use and water retention is all being um, a, a primary focus of this. Mm -hmm. So if there's a takeaway, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Right. And um, I think things interested afterwards, I pulled up the um, endangered species map or priority habitat map for comprehensive water test. Um, some other things to take into consideration are the different views, whether they're good views or bad views, you know, whether you want to clear out a view to see a meadow or the rolling hills, or, you know, you need to screen your, from your neighbor's area because maybe there's something unsightly. So those are things to also consider. Um, and then also natural lighting and artificial lighting. You know, do you have a very shady backyard and you want to open it up? Um, are there really cool specimen plants on your property that you want to um, uplight with landscape lighting? Mm. So these are some things to think about, to consider, yeah. um, um, as you begin to you know, think about designing your own property. Yeah. So let's just go around the room a little bit. Like, are there other things that aren't shown? I mean, there's any number of things. There's a ton of things that aren't on this list. So anyone want to throw some other ideas out about things they might like to see 
um, you know, spaces on their on their land. Or... Um, just to make sure that people see this as a real opportunity um, is to try to restore their land to the nature that once was. And you may or may not know a lot about what it once was. Um, there are ways you can learn about that and maybe have a conversation about that if you want. But the idea is to try to restore what was there to restore the ecosystem function. And, and that way you'll be contributing to helping biodiversity, protecting and restoring biodiversity, and also drawing down carbon. Um, when you maximize the native species and, in, and increase the complexity of the species, then you get more um, interactions and ecological function and carbon drawdown. And that's what we did on our property. And I'm happy to talk with anybody about that and invite you over to my yard and show you what we did. And, um, so if you're interested in helping the current situation with climate and biodiversity, um, that's really something to keep in mind is to try to restore what was once there to the extent you're able while still maintaining a lawn and other features that you want yeah. smaller, but you yeah. still have those features. I'll take the other side of the coin. <laughs> um, we've got a property that is a wooded property and we have wonderful wildlife. Mm -hmm. uh, we would have the big, enormous, horned owls sitting mm -hmm. in a tree, you know, 10, 20 feet from the house. And, uh, we would see all, all manner of wildlife, fox, and of course the uh, opossum and uh, mm -hmm. all other some other nuisance. Mm -hmm. and birds. But it was a it was a definite uh, habitat for wildlife, and so we over time we tried to work with the land. Um, you know, we realized that first of all, mm -hmm. the previous owner had planted tons of non-native plants and a lot of non-native ground cover has become quite problematic over the years. Um, so it's been a matter of rebalancing, as Sharon suggested, you know, looking for natives. And I don't, I try not to plant any non-natives at this point because I have enough. Um, we all have our favorite natives, but I had asked we had a ELA conference this past year, what is a ratio that you can tell us that we should be aiming for mm. in terms of natives. And what they told me was 70% native mm -hmm. to 30% non-native. That's really so that's something information. to really keep in mind. But yeah. I think just the, uh, two things that I would like to kind of focus on is you should assess not only the endangered species, because at this point, wildlife is endangered. Mm -hmm. um, and we're losing it very rapidly. So. I would say, first of all, you want to get a feeling for your land and what wildlife you may have already there. Mm -hmm. So in, in addition to the uh, endangered species. Mm -hmm. And the second one is to, to work with the contour of that land. Mm -hmm. So we never, you know, give something up to make mm -hmm. space for something I don't know. I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say here, but we try to make it most disturbing in the nature of the property uh -huh. as much as we can by, by doing minimal disruption. Mm -hmm. So I've experimented with, or we've experimented with different methods over the years. And for instance, we have grass lawn. We didn't have a lot to start with, we have much less now. Okay. And every year, you know, I've used the cardboard method that you just layered. It's called Get enough of your layers of cardboard and dirt. Okay. And you can actually plant into it after six months. So if you have lawn, it will put it for you and you can put it in the garden. Oh, there you go. So, so you know, there, there's yeah. some nice tricks of the trade that are very helpful. Great. Well, thanks. That's wonderful. Great information there. I, I've never done the, what'd you call it? Spaghetti or? What? Oh, it's called the spaghetti method. <laughs> okay. um, on method. Oh, the lasagna. Oh, that it's Italian, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's the other pasta. <laughs> oh, that's very cute. Um, so, let, any, anyone else want to? Yeah, go well, ahead. Talking about the wildlife, the other issue that we meet with a lot of plants is the deer love. So, if you're planting something that the deer are going to eat, it really doesn't do any good. Right. So that's another thing to be aware of is, yeah. you know, will it be destroyed mm -hmm. uh, come winter or whenever? Yeah, so. does anyone else have this experience? Like the natives don't tend to be eaten as much by the deer. Oh, no. <laughs> is yeah. that not true? 
Uh, <laughs> they'll eat anything if they're hungry. There are, there are, <laughs> thankfully, there are <laughs> native deer resistant plantlets. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And they are, are by the Okay. <laughs> Great. Like planning for a, so I have an old willow in, in my yard that is, you know, it's got one branch. Uh, it's this massive willow, everything else is falling off. It's one branch, but, you know, it's a, it's a, Trying to plan for that to go away eventually. Eventually, that's going to fall off. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, where do I take it down now, or do I, you know, do I just put something behind it? I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. just planning for the next yeah. five years, ten yeah. years, or whatever. Yeah, it's is it uh, a, a wet area on your? It's part of the wetlands. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because still, it's like the full centerpiece. <laughs> I'm sure um, Babylon weeping willow will suck up up to 300 gallons a day, from what I understand. Yeah, they're they're great uh, water. And not good firewood. No. <laughs> and those little black bugs are annoying. <laughs> um, okay, so let's, uh, let's see. Is there anything on here? It is very good, yeah. True, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the pussy willows are awesome too. Like this, this yeah, true. Yep, that's true. Okay, so um, I took a video of my property, um, so you can kind of get a sense as to what it looks like on the ground. Um, start off. So we're starting up here on the back deck. Can you see this? Can you see that? Sorry. All right. Okay. Excellent. So I'm on the back deck here and I'm going down the stairs. And if there's anything you guys see that instantly says to you, like, wow, that's a problem, or wow, that's a really good opportunity for whatever, yes. keep the stairs. <laughs> Yell it out. Just yell it out. <laughs> so this is looking around the backyard space. Yeah. This is looking back towards this side. Right against the foundation. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> yep. This is coming up the side of the house on the southern side. See a lot of exposed foundation on the side. Are those trees on the back? Are they owned by the town or are they yours? Or they're, they're mine. Trees? Yep. So this is coming up uh, to the top of the driveway and looking back at the house. That's dirt. I, I took out a little tree there. <laughs> She's only lived there for a year, so it's a bl blank slate. Yeah, it's a blank slate. Yeah. yeah, so that's here, looking back at the deck and the driveway. Yeah, I, one of the things that, that pops out to me is that the, the house is set below the, the roadway, so a lot of the drainage comes you know, down the driveway, and mm -hmm. how to deal with that. Um, that's the case here. That's the case here, okay. Yep. I'll leave back on this side of the house. Some kind of exposed utilities. <coughs> and yep. mm -hmm. Not a sustainable issue, but it's you know aesthetic. So you can solve two things at once. You know, make your yard more sustainable and aesthetically pleasing. It doesn't have to be just a weed patch or made of you know wildflowers. There's all sorts of my neighbor's yard that can't grow grass right now. <laughs> Similar to the, you have that tree there, a uh, bush that's touching the house. Yeah. Right. So, it, yeah. So, what what do you do with that? Like, I have this beautiful tree, but it, how how much do I cut it back before I kill it? Yeah. So, <laughs> that's that's actually a lilac. That's what I get. And I it is like full grown right now. And when you look at it, you can see all this like suckering growth that that's coming out of it. So, what I have done recently is I just sawed back like all the old stuff because it was getting like this fungus on it. Mm -hmm. And um, you could see that there was so much dieback 
on it that and there was just no room for like the new stuff to come up so i just trimmed back as much as i could and now now it should be pretty happy and like all the stuff should be coming up oh it was a lila yep anyone wanted to shout out some stuff they they saw that if it was your house you would do differently or you'd look to change a lot of grass for opportunity for gardens yep yes okay yep <laughs> Um, is that part of the goal? It's uh, part of the goal in the backyard because I do have um, a sunroom that comes off the main floor. And when you're in it, because this is, um, when you're in the backyard, it's a walkout basement. So my first floor is like way up there along with that sunroom. And you go out there and you see beautiful woods right in front of you, but then you look on either side and you can see the neighbors. So screening right there. Definitely, on either side. Yeah. Do something before you become too friendly with it. <laughs> what about Matt? That's perfect. Well, it doesn't always have to be, you know, a hedge. Yep. Like the situation that Elise described, maybe um, an ornamental tree that sort of interrupts the view between the porch <clears throat> and her neighbors. Mm -hmm. And then it's not like, you know, See, I don't want to see that. <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe just a summer thing or two. Exactly. Right. Summer you want to. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then a tree that you plant could be a native tree that attracts, you know, bees, butterflies, and birds. You know? mm -hmm. So. Do you have a question? I, I, you're just looking at the property, and so you've got a porch to start in the little sort of tree box. Do you have a garage? Um. You know what? I actually didn't draw it on here. <laughs> I should have. <laughs> um, yeah. If I can remember this. I don't have a. Yeah, there's. Yeah. But so it's the screen in. Yeah, so it's behind me right here in this picture. But you will be able to see it in some of the pictures I'll show you later. So let's. Um, is that a river going it is not. So it's a steep slope uh, into some woods, and then right behind the woods there, I have neighbors. Yeah. So down below there, it's another neighborhood. It is another neighborhood, and then it goes into um, conservation land and a giant wetland. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just a topographic line that this, like the the feet dotted yes. line. That's just a topographic. It is. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Talk about sun and wind elements. You know, we talked about sustainable landscaping. Mm -hmm. You can bring down your cooling bills yep. Yep. in uh, mm -hmm. summer by planting trees, mm -hmm. deciduous trees, yep. with a, a southern exposure. And also, mm -hmm. and I can't tell you this, exactly how to do this, but you need trees on certain sides protect against the wind, so you mm -hmm. also save energy. Yeah, yep. good point, absolutely. Yeah, because that's a problem being up on a hilltop, right? right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're like in line with the Worcester Airport, so oh, yeah. you get the wind up high. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's my fault. <laughs> so I, so I did, fertilize it, um, but I didn't have um, a sprinkler to put on in the back. So then I got the wonderful stripes. <laughs> that was bad, that was really bad. Yeah, it does. It, it burned, it burned. There's some geraniums that are growing in there and then it's just a bunch of different weeds. What's the soil like? Is it sandy, is it compacted? It's very good soil. Um, That's good. There, I feel like if you dig down a couple inches, you're going to dig up a field stone. So there's like a lot of stones underneath. But what soil that's there is very decent. Do you know if that was, um, was that properly excavated, that the original soil and new soil brought in? Do you know how it was developed? Um, I don't, but I can imagine that's the case. Yeah. yeah. It's a yeah, subdivision. That's been, that's yeah, it is a subdivision. Protocol for a lot of developers now because mm -hmm. they just try to maximize. 
So they excavate, not, they not only clear cut the trees, but they excavate the soil and they put something in its place which is not good and often contains invasive seed and yeah. so forth. So if you have good soil on top, that's great, but you might want to look underneath and see what's there and, you know, if need be, go back to the developer and have him do some repair work. Um, and try to get good soil and you can work with up and coming um, lawn care or landscape people like Mike, Mike Murray, Soil Solutions out of, um, is he native? I think he's a native. Anyway, you can look at Mike Murray Soil Solutions and he will restore the soil, the soil biology, which is absolutely key to having healthy vegetation, healthy native plants, even healthy ornamentals. You want a healthy soil and healthy lawn. It all starts with restoring the microbial population of you know, microbes and fungi and so forth. Um, so he restores the biology and gets you a good healthy lawn and a good healthy garden as a result of that. So that would be the, like the first step. And then also consider opportunities for food, water, and cover for the, um, to provide habitat for wildlife. Even if you don't have actual habitat um, on your property already, you can still create food, water, and cover and call them the Providers and climates. Right. We talk a lot about grass and stuff, but I mean, that's the whole bottom of this food. Right. Yeah. Basic yeah. vegetables. Everything. And yep. Flowers. All right. Yeah. Do, you have, do you have to be careful not to plant right up to the side of the house so that you, I mean, are you in danger? Do you get water in your basement or such like? Or do you have to? I'm just wondering if, if you need a permission out of the house or not. Um, yeah, so in this case, I have very steep slopes on either side. Thankfully, I don't get any water in the basement. It's completely dry. I feel like I'm lucky in that scenario. Um, but I think part of that has to do with uh, there are downspouts in the front of the house, and those just get piped to the back, and then they just run down the slope, which is actually kind of unfortunate, but it also provides an opportunity to be able to capture that water before it runs off the side. Yeah. yeah. So um, let's let's continue on because a lot of these, you know, these. Um, yep. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, go through these kind of. Yeah. So we'll go through Talk these real quick. Um, so these are some of the things that I um, have been noticing around the property. Um, so right at the front of the house, right, right by this big boulder, there are all these underground utilities. Uh, which is really great. It's awesome having underground utilities, but you have to be really careful if you go to plant there. Um, one of the things that we always stress and will all, anyone will ever stress to you, especially in the next session, is to call a dig safe. Um, to make sure that they mark out all of the utility lines so you're not poking a shovel in the ground and electrifying yourself or whatever. <laughs> um, so the opportunities here, though, would be to um, screen these utilities with shallow, uh, growing plants. And this would be a spot where um, a, you'd probably have to use hand tools. You know, you're not going to want to go in there with a, a cold shovel. Um, but it is possible to screen that. Um, this middle picture showing those downspouts that I was talking about. Uh, there's a downspout uh, that's coming off of, it's capturing the water off of this um, porch in the front. And then there's one right next to it that's capturing all the water um, from the roof of the house. So right now, as it stands, it's all just being piped down, like along the side of the house. And it's not even a perforated pipe. I mean, it's a solid PVC pipe going all the way down. Um, so the opportunity here is to, you know, we could, I could collect uh, the rainwater right, right there, or I could even uh, create a, sort of a swale, which is like a, almost like a small ravine and channel that water down to like um, a rain garden. Pretty, pretty one. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, anyone have rain barrels? Yeah, look at that. Awesome. That's great. Cool. Um, and then the front yard, the last picture, um, I get a lot of full sun in the front yard because it's um, east facing. So, you know, this side gets a lot of great sun, which is a great opportunity for sunny native perennials. Um, and the side of the house right here is north facing, so it gets a lot of, gets a lot of shade. Um, and then the western side, the back, 
um, gets a good amount of sun, but then towards like the later part of the afternoon, gets a lot of shade from all these tall trees in the back. Mm -hmm. And then since this side is south facing and there's a lot of exposed foundation, it gets really hot on that side. So just, just about every condition is represented. Yeah, in this one small, small, small farm. farm area. Yeah, so when you start to walk around your own, I mean, most of you have probably lived in your homes for, for years and are very familiar with the microclimates that you find throughout the yard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a landscape architect, but I've made mistakes, you know, every other year I'm like, ah, that's not doing well here. It's probably getting too much sun or it's, you know, it's getting too, too, too much water or what have you. So uh, garden's never done. And you're always learning something. A big tree comes down, and all of a sudden, you've got full sun where you had full shade. So, you know, uh, those are opportunities to make some changes that can improve the the biodiversity in your yard. And uh, so, gardening is a lifelong project. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a great point. There's so many microclimates. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to learn as you go along what works. Really yep. Well. And it's always changing. So, yep. Yeah. So let's see. What's the next step? Yeah. So along this side of the house, um, there is a bunch of erosion problems. Um, even though I have uh, water being captured uh, from these downspouts and running out of this way, um, there's still so much erosion, water coming down the side, and even from my neighbor's property that's being funneled um, along here. You can see that black line that's on the foundation. That's when that's just to show the builder this is where you need to, you know, grade up to. Um, so you can see that the road is so much that that's now exposed. And also all the utilities that are right here, they're just stuck in this corner. Um, but like we were talking about, this is a really great opportunity to screen with native plants or even um, create a um, rain garden towards the end. So and some of the this impacts is water Yeah. Uh, not from the road, but the roof, the whole front yard, because everything is just pitched okay. in one direction. Yeah, there, there's a like a curving on the on the street. Okay. And there's yeah. a little bit of a hump at a driveway, so at least the water on the road. Okay. So, so, so like the area of the roof will reflect off the area of the front yard and that side is about the same. There's a lot of water there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, it's not a stream, and at least the soil is not so compact that it's just running yeah. on top. Yeah. But it's pretty steep, <laughs> um, which you can see in the next photo too. Is there's a lot of exposed foundation and, and very steep slopes, and um, you can't really see it too well in this picture. But uh, the corner of that foundation right there is actually cracked um, because it's just exposed to the elements. Um, so that we had to repair that. Um, but this is also a really great opportunity to, to plant natives along here. It's plant natives that can take the sun and also screen the foundation. Do you have a fish like that around the property? Um, from the back? And similar problem. Um, and uh, couldn't keep grass on the fish bottom. And I remember it was getting baked by the sun. Um, but uh, I wanted to run a wheel dog. Yep. And then it held water well enough to transfer it That's awesome. Yeah, rather than a set of seeds. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes. Look at my It's also like a switch back to the Yep. Right. Oh, that was really fun. I dug the path and I found a bunch of rocks in the front, so I used those. And I found one rock. It must have been the size of so I sit on the, the, the trench and uh, it worked fine oh. because it's, it's enough width below the lake and it's pitched slightly up hill so it doesn't want to fall down. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. 
It's excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. It is very small. <laughs> um, it's probably like, yeah, five or eight feet. <laughs> it's, it's not much. So um, I, let's, I think the next one is, um, yeah. yes. So this next slide shows the backyard. So this, this first picture is looking this way. And this is a very, very steep slope that's in the back that goes right into the woods. Um, it doesn't look like it from this picture because there's all this vegetation that's growing up on this slope. Um, but what, another thing you can notice in this picture are all the leaves that are in the back. Yeah. So last fall, I raked all the leaves into the back. Um, Worcester has this program, and I was amazed by it because I'm, I'm someone from New Hampshire, from the countryside. And they have this big truck that'll come up um, alongside the curb, and you can just rake your leaves into the street, and they'll just like scoop it up like this with like big claws, and then dump it into a truck, and then they tote it somewhere. And I don't, I don't know what they do with it, but I, I figured a better solution is to bring it back to the forest and feed the forest. Yeah. It's a beautiful tree set here, um, but another great thing is if I ever want to start composting, I can use the food that's already here, or even shred up some of these leaves and use it as leaf mulch um, to help winterize the plants. Um, there's also that one tree that's in the back. Um, it's a really nice looking tree. Um, the only problem is it's in a couple of years it's gonna get a little too big and it's gonna start touching the house and the deck. And it's also a host tree for um, the Asian longhorn beetle, which is a problem in my community in Worcester because Worcester is like a hot spot for that pest. Um, so it might be worth taking that down. <laughs> um, but that'll also provide a great opportunity to open up that lawn space and um, potentially um, use that space for something other than maybe lawn. Um, there's also this downspout that's right under the deck um, in the back. And as you can see, it's just going into a pipe and then it goes right, right under the lawn in the backyard and then out to the slope. So it just goes down into my neighbor's property. It's, it's not very efficient at all, but it's a really great opportunity to be able to, you know, cut off that, that <clears throat> pipe and then be able to just stick a rain barrel there and use that water. Yeah. Putting on the uh, the drywall so it's like yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I guess it, it wouldn't be cool to save rainwater in this recycling mm -hmm. or something like that. Or just say that would be dry and have to water. Right. So let's um, talk a little bit about some of the options <clears throat> for to your point exactly in the lower uh, right hand corner. Um, is an example of a rain garden. And you just dig a, a small little um, mm -hmm. low spot, or if you already have a, a low spot that holds water um, and it's full of lawn right now, maybe just take the lawn out or do the layering method um, that was described earlier and plant some native plants that can take both dry and wet conditions. Um, <coughs> And you know it's a great opportunity just to allow water to infiltrate back down into the, the aquifer um, down below. And then the, the, the one above it is um, how pervious pavers work. Like every company that um, sells pavers these days has a product line that's called pervious. And they have little voids, you know, the, the pavers come together, but they leave a little hole and you fill it with some um, light uh, pea stone or, or, or gravel, um, and the water hits it and goes right down into the ground. 
um, there is a specific way to, to construct that that is essential to get right in order for it to infiltrate. So, um, but they're really attractive, you know, and a great opportunity to, to um, replace some impervious with pervious. <coughs> Right. Good point. Is everyone hear that suggestion? Um, so um, what this gentleman is suggesting is that if you have a mulching lawnmower, that you take some of your leaves that you rake up from the yard and spread them across your lawn and then go over it with a mulching mower. And it helps to like just grind it all up, get it into the, the lawn structure or the, the, the soil structure over time and starts to uh, make a soil that absorbs more water than lets it, you know, and it's good for your lawn and so forth. Um, <laughs> we, we use mulch mowing or have done, mm -hmm. um, but recently we became aware that the leaves are home to a lot of um, critters. And so mm -hmm. um, by removing the leaves and, and mulching them, you're getting rid of the critters. So it's cutting down on our, on our insect population. <laughs> and Mark is on the pollinator committee. So uh, <laughs> now I'm a little, so putting them in the woods is what they're recommending these days. Mm -hmm. And there are other ways of um, building up the lawn. Mm -hmm. First thing to do if, if you have a non-native lawn and you want to try something that is being demoed here, um, we often grow a cover crop okay. kind of situation. Mm -hmm. And cover crops are great because you can buy one that's good for winter and it'll grow in the winter. You can buy one that is, you know, grows in the spring and it dies off in the summer. So basically what, they, what you're doing is you leave that material okay. in. And so that is also building up the uh, fertility of your, your soil. Okay. And uh, I also, I just might say one more thing oh, about fertilizer. Yeah, we should all be trying to uh, eliminate fertilizer use per se because it's high in, um, well, fossil fuels. Yeah, that's <laughs> to right. start with. Yeah. And, um, there are lots of good you know, yeah, and, alternatives and too. And some of the native, you know, using yeah. native on site groups is yeah. a great yeah. strategy. Good. All right, well, we wanted to keep this going because we do have um, a little less than an hour left. And we want you guys to get your creative juices flowing and start to um, put some ideas down. So um, this is just a, a simple list of some of the sustainable things that we've all sort of been tossing around. And the idea for you guys is to sort of look at what's in front of you. You've got the two smaller plans. What we want to do is, um, you know, use the numbers to represent where you want these elements on this property. It can just be simple bubble diagrams with a number inside of it that, that coordinates with that list. And any other stuff that you want to do, whether it's you know your idea of um, the switchback to create an easier access up and down um, between the front and backyard, or uh, you know any other things that you can think of. So, Let's just take maybe um, you know five or ten minutes and start to scribble and and have fun with it. So, okay, you can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just wander around. <laughs> uh, I can, I'm great. I'm great. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
reading it and off of it, so that would help on that side of the property too. I don't know the science is behind it. Yeah, some of them I've seen them, you know, they do have some issues with weeds, yeah. Oh yeah, they just find their way through. I find those to be fun. So, <laughs> this is a good point. Yeah, just put a number. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. Oh, good to know. Anyway, a textbook solution is number four. No, it's not. You know, when I saw a lot of black cows begging to have something in front of it, the site is all about the machine. So where would you put like pollinating bees? Like so you're going to keep the water. Where do you get that bee? A whole bunch. Something will grow up. This way, kind of ugly looking. Yes. Yes. So things I see are mostly as that. Rain. Yeah, so this one is in the main roof and has lots of water and it's underground. This one has less water for the just support. So you do the rain barrel. If you don't mind having a rain barrel in your front door. I mean, if you're trying to display your garden, why you probably just kind of red. You know, advertise. You have a rain barrel. So, so stop. Oh, we're going. Exactly. No, for, for the purpose of this exercise. <laughs> this Well, there should be one on this corner. I mean, this kind of brand new. The hip here. It has one here. I would So, what about the rain barrel back there? Okay, well, a dual ring for all that. Wow. Right. So, can you see the ring for all that? Ring for all that? Yeah. Uh, it looks like a place, but I mean, all I know is this part with the roots goes in the dirt. No, I don't know. So it's with the whole yard slows up and heals it. You have a hard time doing one you have to do something. <laughs> so this, so that the runoff that's coming down here going to the woods would go into. So all right, let's go around here. Number two. Yeah. 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 All right, so are we ready? Design problem. Yeah. Yeah. Are we going to do it with the design? All going to rain garden. We'll keep rain garden. Open bar. Go ahead. I would say, she should keep the front. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's sort of like the front yard is not as So that might be quite the same, but it did seem quiet. It might be on the whole bunch of the way. Sometimes it's not too deep. Yeah, I was thinking that. Too. You saw that black, black 
Black Okay, so we're going to have that in front of us. All right, how's this table doing? Oh, you're doing, you got it, all right. So, you bought the house for your your granddaughter, your daughter, and you're trying to help them make it more sustainable. And what, what would you suggest to them that they do? Like, where would you put? Would you put a rain barrel? You know, where would you put a rain barrel? All right, let's. Uh, I don't want to cut off all this great collaboration, but we have about a half an hour left. Um, so I think we can. Maybe go to the next uh, go to the next slide. Sure. You have the um, clicker. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, well, hey, there's no there's no right or wrong answers. You know, it's it's your vision, your needs, your family, your pets. Um, so, you know, these are just a, a couple of options. So, if you want to, you know, go through what they are and see how you how you. Uh, Compared, I guess? Yeah, so some things that I thought of just very quickly um, when I was working on this was this first option, um, you know, the driveway is a, a huge issue because all the water just comes down the driveway. It sits right in front of the garage and it has a slight pitch. I don't know how it does it, but the water does trickle off to the side, the left hand side over here. Um, but, you know, what do you do with that water? So, you know, there's that opportunity. And I was thinking, you know, Here's opportunities to put in native plants, maybe start a berry garden, uh, blueberries, raspberries, um, all of that, strawberries. Um, maybe even some native plantings in the front, the front yard. There's so much grass that's there. Why don't we reduce that? Um, establish some native plantings. That number two, that's in the back. That could be potentially a rain garden spot. You know, create a, a depression that's in that area um, because my neighbor's yard, his is right there. They're having a really tough time establishing any kind of grass in that area. There's something wrong with the soil there. So why not, you know, carve that out and have um, the wildlife and the planting kind of take over in that spot. And then the number three in the back, um, that's for a rain barrel. Um, like I was talking about earlier, there's that downspout in the very back and it just, all that water just gets piped off to my neighbor's yard in the back. So why not use that opportunity to uh, store that water? And then um, in both scenarios, you know, why not create uh, some kind of lawn alternative in the backyard? It's a decent swath that's back there. So why not slowly start to convert that over the years? And then, um, you know, an outdoor patio, that, that's something that to me, is um, interesting, you know, where can you situate that? So on this first one, you can situate it near the, the, de the deck that's in the back, come off the deck and you're right on the patio. Or in the other situation, um, place it on the other side where you would actually get a little bit of shade from um, that three <coughs> season sunroom that's in the back, which is not, it's not drawn on plants. And I know some people are asking about it, but it's, um, like right up here. So that would be casting shade um, in that spot, which would create a really nice place during the summer to be in that space. But as we were going around, we saw some really cool ideas. I know there's one idea about um, something similar to this one, number four right here, uh, taking out all the asphalt that's there and just doing like um, strips of what do you call it? Like grass, grassy pavers or something along that line. So there's there's grass or like native plants that's 
within that space, but there's still tracks for a vehicle to drive up on. It's a really good idea, very popular idea right now. Uh, what else? Do you see anything? Oh, all sorts of stuff. Um, taking the, the water from the front yard um, down to the back through a little um, fake stream, like a little dry riverbed. Yeah, nice. Yeah, great idea. That's and, cool. Uh, and it could actually, you know, act as a, a, a path as well, I guess, you know? Um, yeah, what other, I guess we can just ask yeah. what are some of the ideas you guys had that aren't being shown up here. Yeah, anything out of the box? I would like to say, <laughs> I mean, it, it took, this is for my property, um, we had rain barrels, and then we had another corner that we showed where you had two sand spouts. Mm -hmm. um, the rain barrels are fine, and rain, the, the water down to the back of the property is okay, but I think it, in this day and age, we want to keep more of the water all on our own property. Mm -hmm. And so different plantings or even considering if there's space enough for a small rain garden that would put that water there. You really don't want to say goodbye to the water. You want to keep it on your land and as much as possible. And so even thinking about the back uh, border that goes into the woods, I don't know what plants are there right now, but that could be an opportunity to plant native shrubs and other things that would slow down the water flow off your property. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So those, if, if this was your property, that would be the perfect thing to do. No, they don't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is, that's the whole point of this exercise, is try to, try to think of ways that you could improve, like if this was your property, but you can also translate that into ideas for your own property. Like what situations that you see here exist on your own property, and what are some ways to, to you know, improve on that? I have a question about rain barrels. We've had one for a long time, but it is so hard to get the water out of it and use it that I just gave up on it because it's 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 not really practical. It's you know you have to build up something under it so you can even get something. There's no pressure. It's I don't know. It's, it just didn't really work. It seems like. You should have a, a an underground tank if you want to really collect the rain or the or the rain bag. <laughs> well, an underground tank really works because you can store the water. Right. It will have an overflow that will let water out, and, but oh, then yeah. you can then attach a pump and a use pump. it for irrigation. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when, it's when big the tank. Yeah, and this is almost a perfect site for something like that. Like that, they do have these wonderful systems that you can install these cisterns underneath your desk, and sometimes they're even if you have a low deck, they're even um, almost like a water bag or a water pillow that you can put underneath a low deck, or even a larger deck like this. You could use those. Um, you sometimes see them at like food facilities or juice facilities. They're big kind of cube containers wrapped in steel. You can repurpose those and kind of create a stack of those, or you can get cisterns that are pre-made to fit underneath a deck with a pump. Because you're absolutely right that rain barrels are hard to use unless you have a good situation. One of the things that I've found that rain barrels are really good for is capturing the rain, and then you can use a low pressure soaker hose and weave it around your plantings. And then you know when it's hot and dry out, before the next rain comes, just open up that low pressure soaker hose that kind of lightly waters them. But as far as some large scale watering, rain barrels are pretty hard to serve that need. But some of these new- On this property, if you chose to put the rain barrel in the front yard, you could get all of it out. <laughs> right, right, the back. That's yeah. true. Gravity. Yeah. Are trees along in this plan? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> more calm the trees and the trees. 
Yeah. I wanted to just echo that. Um, that was when he was thinking about trees. And to say you can't put them without endangering your house, mm -hmm. we had three tree falls in our house, so we love trees, but we had to take down some trees that we loved and put them out, put new ones elsewhere. Um, but you can do that. You can work that with your property. You can design for safety as well as um, for nature. Um, but in shading, that's one way of cooling the local climate in your own yard. And the other way is what Lori mentioned, or another way is the, the detained water in the landscape. So we're finding that we're very concerned about the global climate in terms of temperatures rising, but we can do so much with our local climate in our backyards, neighborhoods, in our communities to provide more shade trees and retain water in the landscape and plant more vegetation, cover bare ground, because that provides for the evapotranspiration of the water through the plants, creating puffy nice clouds above your, your house and neighborhood in town that fall as gentle rainfall. And that's the small water cycle that we want to dominate, it used to dominate. Um, but now we have the large water cycle dominating due to climate change and loss of vegetation on the continent. So we have all of evaporation happening on the oceans and huge storm clouds gathering above the ocean and winds carry it over the continent and just drop it in a deluge. And that's why we have the torrential rainfall that we have now. And it runs off the landscape because we don't have enough vegetation, goes into the rivers and goes into the ocean and actually contributes to sea level rise, which when I first learned that, I was kind of kidding, but it's true. And um, so, so whatever we can do locally to increase shade and water retention has a huge benefit for our local climate. And also, one to another across the landscape can contribute ultimately to global, global climate benefit. There are a number of native trees that are smaller mm -hmm. and really go well in a home setting. Uh, we, there, we put in a number of them. There's the uh, mountain silver bell, which is very pretty. That takes shade, so that may not be appropriate to your site. But do that, do they, magnolias, mm -hmm. and saris with the red bud. Yep. They're all great trees and they're native. And I think you know, probably some of them have pollinator potential. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is that in, in setting up a landscape, it's good to have layers. So if you have your trees, you, you're providing habitat for birds and whatever. And if you have shrubs, you're providing bush for little animals to hide in. And if you have, you know, perennials or pollinator plants are, are a great thing to have as well. So, I see, I think we saw a, another hand here. I just want to make sure we have enough time for everyone to. Thank you. Um, we'd like to recommend a compost bin mm -hmm. um, under the tree line, kind of at the back of the tree yard. Yeah. They're really good. Doing your food scraps and mm -hmm. uh, like one of your ways. Yeah. And create some compost for yourself. That's perfect. Why wouldn't you just make near, near the vegetable garden? Mm -hmm. You could make some good um, canvas. Or yeah. And. Um, it's good to turn it so if, if you have like a series of bins and, and you keep moving it over, then you can make it really easy without much effort. Mm -hmm. And they get to a potter and a bin too, so if they mm -hmm. have yeah. a few seeds that survive, so yeah. well, it's it's it kind of breaks down the potter. Yeah. Seeds are good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's, um, we've got another maybe a little less than 20 minutes, so we'll just keep going and quickly sort of go through. I think. Um, you know, the, the final plan, and we can draw on it, or you can take it home and like kind of figure out your own property, but um, it, the idea is to go through several iterations of, of, you know, your sort of master plan for your yard, and then come up with all of the best elements that you prefer combined into the final design. So that's sort of what's represented here for um, our usual property. So um, it's it's up to you guys. We can either I think maybe we just keep going on. Yeah. So yeah, everyone did a really good job. I think yeah. first round coming up with a pretty good design, and there were also a lot of really good ideas out there too. Um, so yes. 
Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, um, you know, part of going through your design process is, you know, going through and creating a bubble diagram just like this and roughing out areas where you want to create um, your sustainable design. But then also um, the next step of that is narrowing it into your style, um, which varies, you know, from house to house, from person to person. Um, you know, you could do something like uh, Perry style, which is a mix of um, like native grasses, native uh, perennials. You, could, you know, if you have a very rocky site, you could use some of those rocks that um, are on your property and create a rock garden. Um, let's say, you know, you love like, you know, purple and blue flowers. Maybe that's something you keep in the back of your mind. And as you're um, formulating your design, you, you think of a palette um, that incorporates, you know, ma native plants that give off those shades. Um, or even like a New England wildflower garden. Those are always beautiful. You always see those in meadows and everything. Um, or even edible landscapes. You know, you could do something like a veggie garden. You could even do like a berry garden where it's dedicated to just berries. If you have a large enough property and are willing to um, keep up with the maintenance of it, you could even do, um, like, uh, you know, edible, ed um, what do I say, fruit trees. Fruit trees, um, which around this time of year does become a little hard to manage because, you know, the fruit drops, and if you don't pick it up in time, you get all the bees and the wildlife. It's, it's a little tough. But um, it's a huge benefit. Did you mean food forest? Food forest. Nice. <laughs> And so one of the biggest takeaways from this um, to go along with water and everything like that is when you do go into the construction phase of it and you start to, to add in all these plants is, you know, give your landscape time to grow in. When you first establish a landscape, let's say you have a, a barren lawn like what I have, and if I just go in there and drop in a bunch of plants, I'm not going to expect to see, you know, a full grown shrub that's this big. And it, you know all the shrubs are touching each other, and they look beautiful like the first year. You gotta give it time, you know. Especially, for instance, if you're trying to establish a wildflower meadow, you know, you see these pictures online. You're like, oh, that's what I want. That's beautiful. But this is the reality of it. This is the first year of. Um, this is actually a picture our coworker took. He's trying to establish um, a wildflower area, and this is what it looks like first year. You got crabgrass and stuff growing in, but you gotta give it time. You gotta reseed it. Maybe add in a couple of native plants that, that you buy. Um, so that's that's really the, one of the bigger takeaways here. And on the meadow, I, I learned um, from a botanist who was advising us that if you plant meadow using seed mix um, and you want to go native, which is what we have tried to do is go native all the way to really foster the native ecosystem, you can't establish a native meadow successfully without first making sure the soil is healthy biologically and also planting native grasses as the first cover because the, the soil and the native grasses prepare the way for the meadow grasses to take root and be sustainable over time so they come back year to year. If you don't do that, you'll get a great um, meadow maybe the first or second year, but after that it will fade. So keep that in mind too. You can start with um, healthy soil, biologically rich and then plant native grasses and I know New England wildflower or the new name for the um mm -hmm. garden the woods native plants native, 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 native plant, plant trust mm -hmm. and a few other places in Massachusetts they they provide the native grasses that you can plant as the first planting yeah. as you know yeah all right so how do you get them to be invasives? I mean, because this is just going to be bittersweet, ragweed, <laughs> mugwort within, you know, in our yard within a year, about four. Um, you got to pull them and yeah. see them. There's no other way to get around it. Yeah. Yeah. Or embrace it. I, I have a friend who, you know, and, and those who are in permaculture recognize that there are benefits to all of these plants. And so, Mud word and some of those other things are actually medicinal, and so finding a way to work around them instead of getting rid of them, so maybe harnessing them a little bit so that they're not taking over, but still using them for whatever benefit they have. They do still have habitat benefits. Um, they are medicinal, like I said, so humans can use them 
fact, we made a salve out of mugwort and lavender, and it was awesome yeah, um, for, for um, sweet dreams. Um, but you know, everything has a benefit, and it's kind of tough to see that, especially when it's not so pretty. Um, but so finding a way to burning, burning, completely take over. right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Find a way but to harness. Yeah, there are some that aren't yeah. quite as invasive, but like the bittersweet. Yes, that's not, yeah, yeah, I'm talking yeah. about this, the native no, stuff. Don't want any of those. Right. Yes. right. Or the smart <laughs> native. <laughs> that's, um, we've got but some yeah, resources. Oh, sorry. Yeah, not as big. There, there's, um, at the end of this, some resources that you can go and, and see pictures of invasives. And so, you know, you, you take your surface around that has all the invasives and you make a print of them and look for them. Do you have any services that will come in and work with you to identify all the invasives? We have so many volunteer plants on our property, and every year it seems like we're getting more and more. There is an online site called Native Plants of New England, mm -hmm. and they are helpful, but you know, I hate to post every single new thing that starts growing in the yard yeah. by itself, and it would be nice to just find somebody who do, does let it do. Yeah. Uh, wetland biologists, almost all of them, are, are great at identifying invasive species. Uh -huh. yeah. wet, wet, wetland biologists or okay. wetland scientists. Pardon? We're dry There are ecological landscapers yeah. and also botanists right. who will do consulting. Yeah. You know, I have a really poor memory for plants, as yeah. opposed to trees, I'm not bad on trees, but plants. And so I asked a botanist to come and just walk through my yard and help me Identify and I mapped out what plants are what. So oh, nice. Yeah, that's awesome. You can also use an app of trying to picture this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. very good. Mm -hmm. Telling you what the plant is. Oh, really? Yeah. What and then you picture this. this. Yeah. You just take a photo of it. Yeah. I need to. I, there are several of them out there. Um, some are free. Some are, some do like free. a. I thought you I can do a, a trial and see if you like it. Um, so this is a good point. Anyone who has really that, you know, like that, would be a great resource. So um, e email any information that you want to share, um, so that we get this information into the handbook, and everyone in town who's interested is going to have access to that so you know melissa's the the clearinghouse for all of your great <laughs> ideas and and websites and so forth so please get in touch with melissa and <laughs> no no you know what it's so funny like i've been a landscape architect for over 40 years and i learn something new every day i learned something from melissa today and i'm you know twice her so there's a, that's the great thing about being a landscape architect is you never ever stop learning so um and and that's true for gardeners homeowners yeah so we we'll start wrapping it up yeah so i just want to do a quick follow-up on um some things that i did recently so i took these originally i took these photos and that video um, a couple months ago, but since then I've, I've worked on some little projects and you know, this is another thing to, to recognize when you're doing your design. If, if you're someone who wants to do the hands-on work, start with something that's manageable that you know you can tackle. So, you know, in the backyard, there was this wall that was collapsing and um, these trees that were seeding in with all these irises, it's really unsightly. <laughs> Um, so one weekend, I decided to just completely scrap the wall, take all of the boulders and stuff down, all the field stone, restack it, and then uh, the next day, I went in and I filled it with really good soil in there and planted um, uh, plants that will attract butterflies and bees and everything. Cut back the um, lilac that was there because it was unhealthy and I needed the new growth to come up. So it looks a lot better there. Um, Did you go and buy stone? Or was all that in there? It was all there. Yeah. A lot of it was like buried behind the wall too. So, yeah. Has anyone built a stone wall before? Oh, it's the most. It's it's zen. I don't know how else to describe it. It's it's just so much fun, and you know if you have smaller things like that, go for it. 
Just yeah. you know, do a little research, go online, maybe take a class at Tower Hill. They have them every spring. Mm -hmm. Learn how to build a wall. It's really satisfying and very meditative. Okay. Trying to trick people into building walls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, manageable. You know, for me it was manageable. And I live in Princeton, and it's nothing but boulders. And my husband and I collected the rocks wow. for this wall. Yeah, it was back then, but that was 15 years ago. <laughs> Uh, this is a quick follow up on the side of the house uh, where there were all those, um, all that drainage problems. Um, so this is just a quick kind of temporary solution for now. Uh, basically what we did was um, we got rid of a lot of like the weeds and stuff that were growing up in there. And we put down filter fabric first and then we put a layer of stone probably four inches thick in there, and then edge that with stones that we found on the property. So now, um, as the water comes down from those two uh, downspouts, they are discharged into this area, and it just gets dispersed. And the other thing is, too, is as it's coming down a downspout, it's on a tray to help disperse it, but there's also a rock that's on that tray to disperse it further. So that's our temporary solution right now. Um, the, uh, when putting down stones like this, a lot of people will put down a, a layer of fabric or plastic underneath it mm -hmm. to prevent weeds growing in the soil and coming up through it. Um, I recently became a landscaper at the beginning of the summer, terrible time to start doing that, <laughs> um, and have learned from experience that it lasts about two years. And then it just becomes way, way, way harder to pull weeds. Um, so I, I'd recommend against it in most instances. There's some where it's useful. yard from a prior owner 25 years ago still under the lawn and it's it's really problematic and, and it's just um we have to rip up a whole section to get it out and we don't want to do that so yeah yeah even in areas that are limited that if you needed a lawn for a moment you could right the other thing is too is um depending on what kind of fabric you get a lot of times it wicks water away so you know if you if you wrap it around plants and everything, those plants aren't gonna get the water that they need. That's huge. In this scenario, it's just, I put down fabric so that when the water's coming down, it's not bubbling up through those rocks. It also, filter fabric helps to make a separation between the soil and the, the next material. Um, so, uh, you don't, um, well, in the, in the reverse, if you had um, like a stone base, and you had the filter fabric and soil on top of that, it would prevent the soil from mucking up and clogging up the pervious nature of the soil below it. Mm -hmm. So those are, you know, it, it just helps keep materials separated. Um, sometimes it's not all, all about the weeds, but right. nature, quite often it is. <laughs> nature doesn't do that. Pardon? Nature doesn't do that. So what's the way to make to solve a problem without putting the fabric? Yeah, um, I think it's yeah. It's you know, a look at point. Like, look at what nature does naturally, and see if there's another alternative to fabric. Uh huh. Good point. Yeah. Well, one thing it does is it nature fills in all the empty spaces. So when we when we take plants out, we create spaces for invasives to come in, and that fabric is tend to prevent the losing of invasives in the part of weeds. Um, but a lot of it is just to make sure you really tightly seed it and you're growing, you're covering all the bare ground you can to help prevent the weeds. But um, otherwise, it, what does nature do to layer? Yeah, I, I think when I was mentioning, I, I see your point, you're very well taken. The, the reason I explained, try to keep the separation or keep the soil from infiltrating into a stone layer I guess the situation, like if you had a French drain around the base of your mm -hmm. foundation to help with, you know, say the water is getting into your basement and you want to get the water mm -hmm. moving away from your foundation, a French drain will do that. Well, um, what that is, is it's basically, you know, just a, 
uh, square and it's full of stone and it's wrapped in this filter fabric and then there's soil that comes up to it. And there's um, sometimes a perforated pipe in the, um, the stone part of the French drain. So you don't want the soil finds to get in there and start clogging up that whole system. So that's an example. Yes. And we're going to discuss a lot of this in the, in the next workshop, which yeah. is on October 8th in yeah. construction. So, yeah, some of these we should put on our bike rack so we make sure, that, <laughs> or send them to us so that we can make sure we, we cover those. Right. And, yeah. Or any natural yeah. solutions, if you will. There you go. Um, yeah. To that, because these are man made structures, so sometimes they take some man made solutions. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about them. <laughs> cool. So, just to wrap up, um, we mentioned we, we put together. Just a very limited list of some resources, um, uh, different organizations that you can find information that is um, apropos to whatever goals you have for your sustainable landscape. Um, lots of great books, and I highly uh, encourage or strongly encourage all of you to share, you know, some of your knowledge and um, get in touch with Melissa and. Um, you know, provide any resources that you have found to be helpful in, in your goals. For, you know, and these books are available through the conference library. They may not be there, but you can make questions through them at network. Will, will these slides be available online? Yes. yes. They will be. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're a part of the website. Yeah. Yep. I'll keep sending them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we've got like one more minute to just sort of wrap it up. I guess that's, yeah. Um, I think with, I don't know about you, but I, I thought it was great back and forth. Um, if anyone's got some questions or comments that you weren't able to ask or thought of, um, you know, feel free to ask them now. Or, um, you know, hopefully you can go to all three of these because I think you get a lot out of it. Thank you for showing up your house to a room full of strangers. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Yes, thank you. And I think um, sometime over the next week, we'll email you guys out a survey to kind of let us know how we did, um, what you think we could improve upon, what other topics you'd like to see in the future. Anything and everything. We'll have some questions, but then we'll also leave it open. You can include some resources that you want to share there. Um, but any feedback is always helpful. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much for coming. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.